I'm kind of interested obsessively in one thing, and I'll try any technique that helps me answer that one thing. And the one thing I'm interested in understanding is the nature of human choice behavior. And I think it's a central puzzle, why does human choice behavior work the way it does, that has obsessed people really since, I think, the 19, mid, mid to late 1960s. Before 1960, it was so clear. What people did when they made choices was optimize. Each of us was optimizing a different function called our utility function, and nobody wanted to second guess what utility function you used, but everything you did was clear, transparent optimization. In the late 1960s, it became clear that that wasn't a good description. A lot of you know this, and that people seemed to be very intransitive in some of their choices. They made choices which were logically inconsistent, which we could prove seemed not to optimize any underlying function. And this gave rise ultimately to behavioral economics. And, and technically, as economists, we'd say that people are irrational. This is endlessly confusing. Irrationality to an economist is a purely technical concept implying typically a violation of transitivity. And so to me as a biologist, this is a really puzzling, puzzling idea. Why is it that bio evolved biological organisms seem to be inefficient in the way they make choices? They fail to optimize. That's a sort of core idea. And as a psychologist, which is another one of the hats I wear, the way we tend to think of this problem was really an idea gifted us by, I think mostly by Amos Tversky on uh, your right, but by Danny Kahneman and Amos Tversky in their famous work on prospect theory. And Amos's idea, which is really clever, is that the reason people are so intransitive and crazy and busted in their choice behavior is that inside their brains live several different agents. Each one of these individual agents is a perfect optimizer who knows exactly how to achieve what he or she wants. But because our brains are filled with these multiple agents and they fight for control of our behavior, we wind up producing these discontinuities as the control shifts from one agent to another. And these discontinuities make us inefficient, sometimes tragically so. Now, I mean, I have to say that this is a beautiful explanation. It's one that has really, really deep historical roots. This is really the idea that Plato put forward in the Timaeus. He said that we're like a, a, a chariot with, that has a charioteer and two horses, one who is rational, I'm par paraphrasing a little bit, and one who is emotional, and that the charioteer's job is to sort of steer these two things to a, a good end. This is really the idea, I think, at the center of Freud. The id and the ego and the superego are a similar kind of three busted cr critters fighting with each other. And um, Danny and Amos, I really think, what they really did was they turned this into an almost biological idea. Danny would say that's not true, but I, I do think that that's kind of the core notion. The idea is that somewhere in our brain is maybe a financial decision maker who's efficient and rational, and it lives at some physical location. Somewhere else in our brain is a different object that might be responsible for self-control. It's what tells us to eat the salad and not the uh, chocolate cake. And it's when that little guy loses control that we make bad decisions like gaining weight or choosing to consume drugs or becoming addicted to heroin. Um, and, oh, sorry, and that, like choosing to be impulsive and choosing to get addicted to heroin. Now, I have to say, as a biologist, this is a really strange idea. And I, I mean, I hope all of you can imagine, you know, we have all this great biological data about how animals choose in the wild. Animals, you know, moose, we can specify the objective function a moose has to meet when he's living out in the wild, how much salt he has to get, how many calories he has to get, how he's going to achieve these goals, and they achieve it to, you know, five decimal places. And the story is that every animal that we've looked at, whether with foraging theory, the marginal value theorem, does a pretty darn good job of meeting the biological constraints that they face. Except, goes the story of humans, who, although we have taken over the whole darn planet, are tragically busted bad decision makers, the worst animals that ever arose in history. And I mean, to me, even as a young assistant professor, this is a really hard story to live with. And so, I want to propose an alternative view, and one that's kind of a mix of the original idea of expected utility theory from people like my hero John von Neumann, who was sort of the guardian angel of that irrational slide up in the top corner, um, that, but combine it with biology and combine it with what we know. So here's another story. 
Instead of there being 10 choosers inside your brain, there really is one chooser inside your brain. There's a, there has to be one chooser if we're going to be efficient. We have to be able to choose between apples and oranges. And that chooser has to have access to a ton of data. That chooser does weird stuff. That chooser is sometimes impulsive and intransitive. But as a biologist, I have to believe that that chooser builds a representation of the value of the options in the outside world, parks them in his, his or her brain, chooses the thing that has the highest value to him. That's the sort of core idea of expected utility theory. He's maximizing something. But the thing he's maximizing just is irrational. It's weird. It has weird features that we don't understand yet. Now, when we first said that, um, oh, so I'm just going to say that here. So uh, when we first said that 25 or 30 years ago, I think the general reaction was, are you out of your mind? Have you not been paying attention? Do you not read the literature? What's wrong with you guys? And what I'm going to do is I'm going to explain to you something that's taken me 30 years to figure out, which is that um, the thing that makes us kooky in our choices is kind of one thing, and that's the idea that there is limited precision in the nervous system. And we have to deal with the fact that we have a limited precision encoding system. That's our fundamental weakness and our fundamental strength. And that all the strange behaviors we see come from an effort to optimize the efficiency of our choices in the face of the fact that we have limited precision. And I'm going to really beat on this idea and try and convince you of it. But before I do that, I have to kind of convince you that um, there aren't a whole bunch of little people in your head. And this is so pervasive an idea in our culture. It has such deep roots. And I would say that if I went to you know, the Society for Neuroscience and said, raise your hand, are there multiple little people in your head? 90% of people would raise their hands and say, in some sense, yes, that's true. But if I went to the Society for Neuroeconomics meeting and asked that question, maybe two people would raise their hand. And so this is huge disconnect where all the people who study this for a living have kind of decided that wasn't true. But the people who are kind of at a larger distance haven't yet agreed that the people who study for a living are right. So I'm not going to show you the 500 good experiments on this. I'm going to show you sort of three, two from my lab. And this really represents work that my lab did from kind of 2005, 6 to 2015, 18. And so I'm going to tell you a couple of stories. The first story I'm going to tell you is Joe Cable's story. He was a postdoc in my lab. He's now a full professor at Penn. And um, Joe was interested in one of these fundamental weird intransitivities, this, um, which is called impulsivity in discounting. When we make choices in time, if I, let, let me put it this way. If I say to Arrow, Arrow, who's one of the most patient people I know, I mean, disturbingly so. And I say, Arrow, which would you rather have, $20 now or $22 in a month? I'm hoping that Arrow would say, I would rather have $20 now. It's not worth waiting 30 days for $2, a perfectly reasonable statement. Can you live with that? But if I ask Arrow, OK, in, <laughs> no, hang on, hang on. We'll flip a coin in a minute. Um, if I say to Arrow, yeah, you're right. That's fair. <laughs> OK. Okay. I hope there's more coming. Okay, no, there's more coming. It said, but if I said to Arrow, in, in a year, $20, or in 13 months, $22? If Arrow's normal, he'll say, well, it's a year from now, I'll take the $22, I'll wait the extra month. Now, I want you to understand this is an intransitive decision, because as we're marching through time, every day I say to Arrow, well, you said, you'll take $20 now, but you'll take... $22, if, you have, if it's a year in the future, I ask him again after a month, I ask him again after a month. I have to, you get that at some point I walk up to him and I say, oh, it's uh, been 263 days. You're going to stick with your old decision. He says, no, I'm changing my mind. And then he gives me back the $20. <laughs> <laughs> <So>, um, <laughs> OK, so people do this. It's a really weird behavior. Economists struggle with understanding why they do it. It's called hyperbolic discounting in our trade. And so all we did was we said, oh, well, that's got to be because there's an impulsive little guy in the brain. And when money's immediately available, he says, I'll take it, I'll take it. But there's a patient guy somewhere else in the brain. And when it's so far off in the future, that patient guy controls behavior. And we ought to be able to design an experiment. We can find the impulsive guy and the patient guy and uh, separate them biologically. And I actually thought that experiment would probably work. As some of you know, John Cohen's lab did a very fast version of that experiment and seemed to find evidence for the, uh, in the 
let's see, for the, he, he found evidence for the patient guy. No, the impulsive guy. I can never remember which one he said he found. Um, he found evidence for the impulsive guy, but not the patient guy. And he said the patient guy's somewhere else. So, I don't know. So what Joe did uh, was, I think, really put this to bed in a long series of papers that really made his name. This is an example of a really patient, a moderately patient chooser. Woodford's here, so this is not a very patient chooser. He knows what a real patient chooser looks like because he's a real economist. Um, and what I'm showing you is how the value of money declines with delay up to 180 days. And you can see the money drops here loses about 40% of its value for this chooser. This is a really crazy impulsive chooser. This guy, money loses in six months 98% of its value. And what Joe showed was that regardless of whether you're a steep discounter, a medium discounter, or a super steep discounter, there's always basically two places in your brain where you can see the value of money at whatever delay you're going to get it. And that's the medial prefrontal cortex and the ventral striatum. And it turns out this is a really universal phenomenon. I can read out the activity in this brain area Look at how it declines for a chooser with delay. This is shown in black for the neurobiological data. And in red is the behavioral measurement. So there's this perfect, perfect match between the activity at this one spot and your willingness to wait. If you're impulsive, this spot is impulsive. If you're patient, this spot is patient. And there's no evidence that there are two people in you. There's just one. And it has this weird hyperbolic discounting function, which is hard to understand and which is intransitive. Everybody got it? So you are intransitive. That's absolutely true. But it's not because there are two. It doesn't seem to be two people. You seem to be coherently intransitive. Now, this turned out to be a widespread finding. There have now been 20 labs that have demonstrated it. Um, it's been demonstrated in hundreds of papers. There's kind of no doubt at left at this point. Your ventral medial prefrontal cortex and your ventral striatum are impulsive if you're impulsive, they're patient if you're patient, and they show this nice, clean function, this one representation of value, but it has this weird feature. But maybe that's just about discounting. When Fat Levy joined my lab, the Fat's now a full professor at Yale, she did a similar kind of experiment. She looked at um, people facing risky options. These are kind of traditional economic lottery choices versus uh, lotteries where we'd obscured some of the probability. People hate that. And uh, the story was, oh, well, changes maybe in your response to risk when you know what the risk is and when you don't, that maybe represents two people. There's kind of like an angry little squirrel somewhere in your head that's afraid. And when we turn this thing on, that afraid little squirrel engages, and it leads to the changes that appear across these two cases. And again, if I did that experiment, I'm not going to belabor it. And the story was exactly the same. The medial prefrontal cortex and the ventral striatum capture everything. There's a single representation of value. It's in this one place. It probably comes from lots of different complicated inputs, for sure. I'm not telling you about any of that. That's cool and interesting. But somewhere in the brain, there's this one value representation. It predicts what you're going to do, even when you're being intransitive. I think the most compelling version of this um, was for, by Russ Poldrack <clears throat> and Craig Fox, a pair, an economist and a uh, neuroscientist. And they looked at uh, how you represent losses in the brain and how you represent gains in the brain, surely being afraid of losses. We treat losses really differently than gains. It's really weird. They saw the same thing. If the brain area represents gains, it represents losses. Losses are just negative gains. There's no separate system for representing losses. If anything, the losses are represented less completely in the brain. And so this led us to propose um, in about 2012 for the first time that there was a kind of a single common representation of value in the brain and that it was irrational and that there was no hint of these multiple critters living in your brain. And uh, this, is, uh, wor this original proposal was by uh, Dino Levy, another of my postdocs who's now a full professor uh, at the University of Tel Aviv. And Dino here, Dino's showing a social experiment. This is a representation of value when you're valuing time with another person who you'd like to be with or valuing getting away from somebody you don't like being with. Monetary values. And um, there's, you can see really clearly that these are all represented in the same place. The story is so clean. Joe Cable then went and redid this experiment. He did a 250-study meta-analysis, showed the same thing. 
Antonio Rangel's group at Caltech did this experiment again, and he showed the same thing with John Clitheroe. Clith okay, so I'm just telling you, you better believe me. <laughs> it's one, there is a common value representation in the brain. There are not a lot of people in your head. There's one of you in your head. But that one of you is weird. So why is that one of you so darn weird? Now, psychophysicists have thought about this problem for a long time, and economists have too. Um, you know, if, if, I was a, if I was a neoclassical economist from the 1950s, my idea would be that there's a bunch of cool stuff out there. Here's something of low value. It's a little candy. Here's a cool sports car. And these things are transformed by some compressive function into what you might think of as the subjective value you place on these things. And when you make choices, says that economist, I just say, which would I rather have a candy? Well, that's worth about you know, one util. Or this cool sports car, that's worth like a gazillion utils. And if I give Arrow a choice, would you rather have the candy or the sports car? Hopefully Arrow says, give me the sports car. Everybody good? Now, psychophysicists have thought about this kind of same idea. Psychophysicists have a slightly different take on it, which then began to influence economics really strongly in the 1970s. And that's the notion that these transforms from objective to subjective um, have an intrinsic variance term. The idea is that if I tell you the objective value of something, you don't get a particular number out. You get some range of numbers out which has some noise distribution around it. This was a classical idea. This is the just noticeable difference of psychophysics from the 1800s. It entered economics through the work of Dan McFadden in the mid-1970s. So that's all kind of interesting. And I want you to now bear in mind, this is the central thing I'm going to talk about today, that our representations are noisy. And that is a fundamental problem. In everything about our neural architecture, everything strange you do is about solving that problem. Let me flesh that out, because we don't often think about it this way. I want, to, I want you to understand how big a problem this is. Our brains consume about 10 watts of power. The crappy computer on my desktop consumes about 800 watts. A good postdoc in my lab has a computer that consumes uh, a couple of thousand watts. It's tempting to say that's because this is such a bad machine. But that's just not true anymore. That might have been true 30 years ago. This machine can do a lot. It's super precise. But it's using about 30 times as much power as we are, 40 times as much power as we are. So that's interesting. We're operating in a very low power regime. That's a fundamental feature of biological organisms. I eat, well, I, I'm not going to tell you how much I eat. Arrow eats 2,000 kilocalories a day, of which 400 go to serve his brain. Now, let's imagine that Arrow decided he wanted just, I'm not going to show that picture, don't worry, uh, <laughs> that he wanted to just increase his precision, neural precision, by a factor of 10. That's just one decimal place. What would that involve? That would involve something like scaling up the size of Arrow's head 10 times. Now you know which picture I'm thinking of. A 10 times scale up of Arrow's brain to a 100 watt brain his, his brain would now consume 70% of his food. He'd have to eat 4,000 calories just to feed his brain. He would have to eat about 6,000 calories a day. So Arrow would have to eat three times as much food as he eats today to achieve one decimal place of increased precision. Everybody get this idea? Now think about that. Um, that means that Arrow would be much better at picking his favorite candy bar, but he would have to eat three candy bars, not one, every time he made that choice. And I don't think it's a stretch to say that sounds uneconomical. OK, I'm going to restate that from a paper that um, I published with um, my postdoc, Kai Steverson, and my longtime uh, collaborator, game theorist, economist, and uh, thermodynamicist, he actually is, Adam Brandenberger. And um, I've got to remind you that information and energy are the same thing. Everybody kind of knows this, but remember that's a, when we say that um, we can use information theory, which derives from thermodynamics to explain the information and entropy of some concept, um, we're not, that's not an as if. That's like really true, right? You can cool a computer chip by using information theory. 
Okay. So what Adam did was, uh, with, after me nagging him for a long time, was um, we just wrote down a standard thermodynamic equation from classic thermodynamics. We wrote it down in information theoretic terms. We asked, what's the entropy of a given representation? This could be anything. It could be a car. But I'm just using it about your brain, but this is the laws of physics. I'm not saying anything that interesting. This entropy is simply the, uh, described by this little choice here. Let me put, I should have said it to left to right, uh, right to left. As the probability of producing the right choice drops to chance, the entropy of your representation goes up. That's kind of dopey, right? That's like so easy. Now, if you do enough magic uh, math on this, this, I just actually mean a proof that is way outside my skill set, we can rewrite that this way. And what Adam does here is he puts on the left all of the costs associated with reducing entropy. So I'm going to improve my representation to make it more accurate and less entropic. But I have to pay a cost, and I'm going to put all the costs on the left-hand side. And here, I'm just taking the maximum possible entropy. This is a system that is completely disorganized and produces no coherent behavior. This is the entropy associated with some arbitrary neural encoding. The difference is the entropy reduction that's been achieved. And that has to be, that improvement has to be multiplied by the cost of improving. That's kind of obvious, right? So the interesting thing about this is that um, this relationship is multiplicative. It seems almost trivial that it's multiplicative, but you're going to see that's a really deep insight. It's going to mean that all efficient representations are divisive by definition, by thermodynamic constraint. Okay, let me say that a slightly different way. I'm just going to re-say that. Here's a psychophysical curve, which has high variance around it, and you pay 10 watts for it. If you want to reduce this variance, you have to pay more in watts. I just said that. That's kind of trivial. And the relationship's multiplicative. Everybody okay? Okay. Blah, blah. So there's arrow on the right and me on the left. And it's probably not right. Okay. Um, I should have thought of that before I said it. Okay. So, so now I'm going to take you the next step. So the first thing I said was just thermodynamic law, improve precision, you got to pay for it. So now let's take a look at how you would improve precision, given that precision is really costly. Everybody okay? Here's the simplest possible way to represent value in the brain. It is what you would call an expected value representation. As I increase the objective value of something, let's say in dollars, I increase it linearly. Let's think about what that would look like. So if I had to choose between an object here and an object here, that would mean I would be comparing these two values internally in my internal representation. Remember we talked about the entropy of internal representations? That looks pretty easy. Okay, wait, but let's put noise in. And now let's look at what that noise projects on the left-hand side. So here, I'm choosing between these two. This is the error distribution around the bottom one. This is the error distribution around the top one. And I hope what you can see is with just a little noise, this problem is now just about insoluble. I am no way going to find the better candy bar reliably with just a little bit of noise. Everybody okay? So that's a cost. Now let's say I told you that we're going to make choices over things that all lived in this value range. Well, now that's kind of interesting because you are now wasting all of this coding space. Everybody good with that? You're only using a very narrow range to tell you something. And this is because I've told you that the choice set has this intr intrinsic correlational structure that's just the same as saying that there's a hidden loss. If the choice sets are structured, I'm going to speed up a tiny bit, what I really should do is adjust my coding function. Ah, so now we're back to the neural representation, right? That I was telling you, you have to adjust your neural representation to minimize entropy. I should adjust my function so that it shows all of its dynamic range where I'm expecting to encounter my choice objects. This is so obvious. And in fact, that's just, that's the trick. Here I'm doing this more formally. This is really work 
that harkens to, this is multidimensional and it's much harder, but this is kind of Simon Laughlin said this uh, in the 70s, and the, his idea was you take the distribution, the probabilistic distribution of the things you're going to have to face, he was talking about visual stimuli, we're talking about choice objects, and you simply take its integral, said Laughlin, and this integral, which is now going to look pretty sigmoidal, that's going to be the most efficient representation if you face noise. Let me show you that in a tiny bit more detail. See, here's if you don't use the sigmoid, and I've got this huge amount of overlap. And here I've used the sigmoid and centered it on my two choice objects, and you can see how much I've driven the two representations apart. Okay, so sigmoids are a signature of respecting the losses. They're that little f function. Okay, so I'm saying that a slightly different way. I'm saying that what you really want to do in order to maximize information in the posterior distribution is you take the thing you're looking at's true value and you divide it by all the costs, all the losses. All the bad stuff goes into the denominator. This is a really deep fact. If you tell me that the representation you're using is subtractive, as many choice representations are, this tells me that that's not efficient, provably not efficient. Only divisively normalized functions can efficiently incorporate costs by the laws of thermodynamics. This is sort of the core insight of that paper. Oh, and I just said that. Okay, so has anyone ever done that? Actually, someone in this room did that. But um, Les Arrow and Heger and I start fighting with each other. Luckily, Heger's not here, so we don't have to. Um, Heger published it first. That's definitely true. Um, and so Heger's idea, and this should probably be familiar, was that there's probably something really good and efficient about building a visual coding system in which the input to the visual system is divided by the activity of all of its neighbor cells. So David's idea when he said that was um, that the denominator would carry something like uh, well, something about the variance of the inputs and some kind of weighted sum of all of the inputs. And that what, what at the time we all thought we were doing was we were capturing information that was shared amongst all the units nearby and sort of dividing it out of the representation to maximize information in the output. Everybody okay with this idea? This is pretty familiar. Arrow really did the math on this. Um, I'm just going to share the intuition really fast, looking again at my hero, John von Neumann. Um, Arrow would have said it, I think, this way, but not with a picture, but with a picture of some like 1960s lady from Bell Labs. And um, so I'm going to look at the pixels on his forehead. If um, pixels are correlated and they're near each other, this is a fact of life. If I know this pixel is black, sorry, if I know all these outer pixels are black, then I know this inner pixel is black with a probability of like 99.5. 9%, and we want to just kind of incorporate that into our models. Okay, so now I'm going to say the same thing another way. I know this is boring. I keep saying the same thing. Oh, this is Arrow. And this is Arrow's Emmy, in case you didn't know. Okay, it, the Arrow looked like that when I met him. Uh, okay, so the idea here is what Arrow did with Adelia Schwartz and with Martin Wainwright, which was super interesting was they were kind of chasing the same thread numerically, not in a closed form proof. And they um, examined what happens to the information content, to the entropy, numerically, of the output when you looked at 50,000, I think 50,000 pictures. And uh, so they would show this, uh, this encoding scheme, 50,000 images, and they would tune this number, and this number, and this number empirically and see if they could gradient descend to really high efficiency representations. And they found that there was a, appeared to be a strong local minima and that you could actually show that this encoding scheme seemed to really give you a superbly efficient representation of images. And if you follow this thread long enough, you, can win a, you too can win an Emmy for encoding audio images, audio sound, sounds, whatever, audio stuff. Okay, so now I'm just going to repeat this paper. I know I wasted a huge amount of time, but this is the core insight, and it's going to go really fast after this. There are constraints in the outside world about how entropy works. And the most important constraint is 
that if you want to decrease entropy, increase information, do a better job, get more rewards, you have to pay more in terms of energy. Now, when we organize that equation, we can actually put all the costs or losses kind of in one space of the equation. And on the other, we can put the thing we're trying to keep track of. When we do that, the thing we're keeping track of always goes into the numerator. And the thing that we're trying, the costs and losses always go into the denominator. And the denominators generally have to have a constant in them and another piece which we're going to look at. But remember, that's the equation that Arrow and David had kind of pioneered, this equation called divisive normalization. And so now what I am telling you is divisive normalization is provably a member of a class that is efficient for representing value. And that if you use this class, you ought to be able to explain a lot of stuff. Everybody OK at this point? Now I'm going to add one last fact before we go into all the cool stuff. And that is, uh, we were also able to prove that this divisive normalization style of representation is actually equivalent to the loose choice rule with a little tweak that allows the loose choice rule to be a little bit irrational. And that's kind of cool because it meant that we had proven identity between the laws of thermodynamics, something pretty darn close to Arrow's divisive normalization, and the violations of choice theory that we've been trying to study for the preceding 20 years. OK, so I said all that, I said all that, I said all that. So how does this really work? OK, so now I'm going to now chase this equation for a while. I'm going to argue that the left side of this equation is how much something is subjectively worth to me, like utility or subjective value or discounted value, or whatever you want it to be. And that the discounted, uh, the utility is simply the true value of the object raised to an exponent over what's going to turn out to be the mean value of the choice set, the center where I want that function to twist, plus the sum of all the things I'm looking at and considering as my current choice set raised to this exponent. Okay, let me flesh that out now. Let's take a look at what beta does, changing this exponent. When beta is small, the curve looks kind of like this. And as beta increases, the steepness of the curve goes up. This look should look really familiar to you. This is a neoclassical utility function. It's exactly what von Neumann drew. It, it's what Bernoulli drew in 1750. This is Kahneman Tversky's value function, the puzzling irrationality that arises sometimes. And what I'm telling you is that divisively normalized equations have one continuous property, which is they can switch from, well, they have two continuous properties, I'll show you the other one in a second. They can switch from this neoclassical utility function to this steeper uh, kahneman tversky style utility function. So this core irrationality, why does it arise? It arises because we're dealing with noise. The efficient solution to noise is to build an internal representation which can sweep from the neoclassical function to the most arbitrary kahneman tversky style function you can imagine. Everybody okay? Now, there's the second term. In Heger's original equation, this was a sigma. And what it does is it causes the function to shift to the right. What it actually does is it controls the center point of the function. Everybody see that? And so that's kind of cool. Because remember, I showed you in that earlier picture that, at least theoretically, what you'd want to do is center the, the curve on the center of your distribution. And then you'd want to adjust its slope, maybe. I'm going to show you why you want to do that in a second. OK, everybody good with this idea? So now I've just like, I, no, I didn't just show you um, a standard behavioral economic set of functions. I showed you a set of physical laws derived from thermodynamics. They just happen to look just like behavioral economics. OK, so that's a cool story. Um, at, this is the point at which uh, any experimentalist should say, Paul, that was a great story, and I really couldn't care less because you told me something neat about thermodynamics, but you didn't tell me anything about the brain. Like Yuri's sitting there going like, oh my god, another theory talk. OK. So, 
the first time we went after this it was really simple. This was with um, my long-term uh, collaborator, uh, Kenway Louie, who's at NYU. And Kenway and I were recording from single neurons that we hypothesized encoded a value signal based on some earlier experiments. And what we did is we just had monkeys choosing between a green target and a red target. And the only trick was we would vary the magnitude of reward for the green target or the magnitude of reward for the red target. Not that interesting. The monkey just has to find the better target. Sometimes we'll be recording from a neuron telling us about the green target, and sometimes we'll be recording from a neuron telling us about the red target. OK, this is not so great. It's like, so what? So here, on this bottom row, oh, I wonder why it's doing that. Here, on this bottom row, what I'm going to do is I'm going to increase the value of the target in the response field, and you can see the neuronal firing rate goes up. OK, so that's good. We already shown that. The firing rates code something about the target. Everybody good with that? But here's the kind of interesting thing. The denominator of this equation says something weird. The thermodynamics tell us that if I increase the value of the target in the response field, firing rate should go up. But if I increase the value of, sorry, in the response field, the firing rate should go up. If I increase the value out of the response field, I increase the size of the denominator, and the firing rate should go down. Everybody got it? And sure enough, when we increase the target, Outside the response field, this totally unexpected property appears. The firing rate goes down. OK, that's kind of meh. How about this? Because growing, growing the de denominator, this sensitized us to the importance of the denominator. Imagine I was looking at a normal value system. So what I'm drawing is uh, along the horizontal axis is the firing rate of my neurons. And it's in response to a stimulus, which, uh, an offer, which has some mean value at the center of this Gaussian. So I get some sort of like noise distribution. Every time I show my monkey this little target, I get a firing rate that's drawn from this Gaussian. And there are two options, one here and one here. And what I want you to see is the blue one's better than the black one. That, but they kind of overlap a little. So this monkey gets it wrong about 20% of the time. Everybody good? So here's this crazy thing about the, the, about the normalization, about the thermodynamics. As I increase the value of a third option that the monkey will never, ever, 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 ever pick, but the monkey knows it's there, and he knows what its value is, so he's representing it in his choice set. These guys decrease in their firing rate because the denominator is growing. I'm imposing an informational constraint. I'm increasing the entropy of the system by shifting that thing to the left. Everybody got it? And so the prediction is that an unchosen third target, as it increases in value, should increase the stochasticity of the monkey in choosing amongst these two targets. This is a really weird prediction. So we did that. We trained monkeys to make choices. They're choosing between a fixed option and an option that's increasing in value. You can imagine here the monkey's indifferent. Here he weakly prefers this one. Here he strongly prefers this one. I'm going to do it under two conditions. Once when the third target is really, really crappy, and once when the third target is only pretty crappy. And here's what that data looks like. Here we're looking at two monkeys. This is what happens when the distractor is small. And what I want you to see is the monkey. This is, if you don't want, look at choice curves all day, like me, this choice curve may be a little uh, weird. Here he's at 50-50. He doesn't care. They're the same. Here he's getting it right about 80% of the time. Everybody got that? When we move the unchosen third target up in value, he goes from getting it right 80% of the time to getting it right only 65% of the time. This is a huge impact of an unchosen target. But you know, it makes perfect sense from an information theoretic point of view. I'm injecting more entropy into the system. The system has a fixed informational capacity. The degradation is predicted by that equation I showed you, which captures this basic idea. Just to be clear, he, he never chooses. He never chooses it. So you might say, Arrow might say, well, how does he even know what's there? And the answer is every, what we actually make him do is we make him take the third target. Every five trials, the lights flash and say to him, on this trial, you have to sample the unwanted third target. You can choose during the other trials, whatever you want. And so we can actually say with absolute certainty, once they, once they were trained properly, uh, which took a few weeks, um, they never once took the crappy target. 
under any circumstance, except when we told them they had to. And we, of course, we had to tell them to take it once in a while because we were moving around its value every day. And so it would go from low to high, high to low, low to high, high to low. So they had to be forced to sample it to know what block they were in. And as soon as they sampled it, firing rates, the global firing rates start dropping, and the efficiency of the choice goes to pieces. And um, this is true of humans, too. As soon as we did this, people were like, ah, monkeys. So um, here's the drop. This is the slope of the logistic. Here's the logistic changing slope. I'm not going to belabor this. This is the logistic slope dropping, the choice curve flattening as, the offer, as a third option, a distracting option, increases in value climbing up this little hill. So humans show the same behavior. And these are really robust. The two things I told you have been seen now in like 10 labs, 20 labs. They're completely uncontroversial. Here's another one. This is, I mean, it's crazy that all these worked, I have to say. This is the, called the curse of choice. Um, this is a kind of well-known fact. If I give you too many options to choose amongst, you do a really, really bad job. Now, of course, you can imagine. What I'm thinking is, as I'm adding options to the choice set, I'm increasing the informational burden on the network. And that's increasing the denominator. And the result is that the choice should go to pieces, and it should go to pieces in a very particular way a way predicted by this divisive relationship, not by a subtractive relationship, not by a multinomial probate relationship, not by any of that stuff. And so um, this is work that I did with Kenway uh, with, and with Ryan Webb, uh, another former postdoc who's now uh, an associate professor at the University of Toronto. And here's like a cartoon of this, the, the full, the really beautiful version of this paper just came out two years ago in Management Science. What I'm showing you here is the probability that you'll pick the best item as a function of how many items I put in front of you. The data is actually this red line. So if it's two, you get it right about, I pick things that are hard. You get it right only about 68% of the time. But if there are 12, you, you basically, you really suck at this. Here's the probability you'll pick the second ranked item, 32% if there are only two, spinning down to whatever it is. OK, and here's the third, and here's this captured for up to 12. And what I want you to see is um, this blue line is a divisive model, and the green line is a multinomial probate. It's the standard economic model. Now, I'm trying to fit all the choices with one model, so that makes it a hard problem, because there's tons and tons of data I have to fit with just two free parameters. And um, <clears throat> this really looks like a divisive normalization story. OK, I'm telling you one more. I promise this is the last one. I think it's the last one. Um, and this now has also been replicated um, in my old postdoc, Agnieszka Tamula's lab at the University of Sydney, um, using a totally different procedure. But the idea is really simple. In the equation, sorry, I have to go back to the equation. I thought I had it in that slide. Help, where's my little precious equation? Uh, this little guy here. Right? He controls the left-right position of this function. Right? Everybody got this? So here's a kind of mean trick. Imagine I made arrow choose over really, really crappy things for a while. And so his b got really, really small. He shifted his function way off to the left. And then, without warning, I suddenly changed to high-value options. His function would take a little while to recalibrate. I'll show you that in a second. And the prediction is that he'd be making his choices up, in the raw, up at this place where, first off, he'd be really noisy. And second off, oddly, he'd be overbidding. He'd see things as higher value than they really are. This is a kind of weird, this is a really weird irrationality, I think. So Mel Kaw did this. Um, Mel it was a graduate student of mine who actually now uh, works for a major video game company. He works for Xbox. He's the smartest of us all. Um, and so in Mel's experiment, what we're looking at um, are 30 goods ranked from the crummiest to the best. And we use a procedure to figure out this is a subject-specific ranking. We know exactly what they're worth in dollars, each one of them. And this is trial number. So at first, um, Mel just starts throwing things up. Hey, here's a Snickers bar. How much do you want for that Snickers? How much would you pay to eat that Snickers bar? 
There's a lot of subtlety here. The, su the subtlety is the subjects are starving. They're trapped in the lab, and they can only eat the food that they buy. And um, there's a fixed probability on each trial that will stop the game and throw a die, and then they'll, they'll either buy the food or not buy the food using a, an incentive-compatible mechanism called the Becker de Group Markshack auction. And I'm not telling you about that. Just trust me. We know, we know what this thing's worth to them. OK, so they tell us. And we actually also ask, how much do you love it? OK, we do that for like 80 trials. And then we pick all of the high-valued options, and we make them bid on them for 300 trials. And then we go back and we check the whole set. And then we have them bid on low ones, and we check the whole set. So I'm going to show you the low adaptation. I, I guess I have both. Yeah, I do have both. So here's what happens. Immediately after a high adaptation period, the choosers, um, a high adaptation period, I told the story about a low, but let's start with high. The choosers underbid by 12 cents for these $1 items. That's a huge underbid. And this underbid decays over the course of 90 trials, about five minutes to here. It takes about eight to 10 minutes for them to get back to their baseline levels. And if we low adapt them, we do the same thing. Um, the, Black lines are the model fit. The, um, the dots are obviously the data. OK, so this, this works, right? Um, the story looks like divisive normalization is a pretty darn good predictor of what's going on in the brain. And, and I, for me, as a biologist, that's really satisfying. The idea here is that animals are shoved up against a thermodynamic problem. They're trying to do the best they can with a noisy internal representation. And it's not like we're bad animals. It's just that representations are noisy in the brain, and you're stuck with that. And evolution knows this thermodynamic problem, and it adopts the efficient solution, which is a solution of this class. Everybody OK so far? Yeah, so the way, yeah, that's a great, that's a great question. I, I definitely cut that corner. So this guy, right, everybody gets, is trying to represent the middle of the distribution. Everybody got that? It controls the left-right position of the function. So here's a really great question. How do you know what the middle of the anticipated distribution is? How do you do that? Especially if the distribution is non-stationary. Like, Arrow's sitting here. I'm offering him $20 bills and candy. And he has to go out in 10 minutes and buy his new Maserati with his Emmy Award uh, winnings. And uh, so now he's going to be in a much, much higher value regime. And he doesn't want to be using his candy bar function in the Maserati shop. Everybody OK with that? So there's a, a, a hidden piece here, which is um, this is kind of the steady state equation. How does the equation work dynamically? Now, I'm not telling any of that story. Um, like XJ knows that we've been working on that problem with uh, neural network models for about 10 years. And we have a model that can compute this in real time, and it uses PV positive interneurons and somatostatin interneurons and blah, 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 blah. I'm not talking about any of that today. So that's a really, really good question and one that we've dug on really hard. I think the idea you should just capture in your head is imagine that this was doing something like what a dopamine neuron does when it computes a reward prediction. That's kind of the basic idea. And the time constant is going to be super important, has to be adjustable. So think uh, XJ's Bernanke papers, where you might have a row of these mechanisms, each operating with different uh, time constants. And you're going to have to select the one that's the right time constant. Think Josh Gold's lab. Um, and, and we've done a lot of work on that, which I'm not, just not, I don't have any time to talk about. OK. <laughs> So the next thing I want to say is uh, we're really in the home stretch now. The next thing I want to say is um, one thing I have not really proven is that this particular equation that Arrow and David and I have been monkeying around with on and off for the last 25 years is the optima. I did not say that, right? Everybody gets this. What I said was it has to be divisive. If anybody tells you it's subtractive, they're itching for a fight. The second thing I told you is it has to carry, it has to have all the costs bundled into it. And for distributions of choices that shift left and right to high value and low value, 
it probably needs to have something that can shift it left and right. And for distributions of choices that can flatten or peak, I'm introducing a new idea here secretly, um, it probably needs to adjust its peakiness. And for distributions where the objects have different degrees of correlation, it probably has to in mess around with that too. Oh, okay, so this is the new idea, the last new idea. And this is an idea of uh, my ex-graduate student, uh, Stefan Bucher, who's sitting there quietly in the audience, now mortified, um, who is now a postdoc with Peter Diane. And what Stefan realized was that the optima can only be the optima for a particular choice environment. Imagine that the function is operating in a choice environment that has a very high average value and only three options. There might be one solution, one optimal encoding function for that. And if you were in some other regime, there might be some different optimal encoding function. Ah, so this is an incredible idea of Stefan's. The idea that the optimal function depends on the probabilistic distribution of the input, of the choice sets you face. So this allows Stefan to ask a really cool question that I could never have, like I do not have anything like the skill set to ask, which is, okay, rather than ask what the optima is, we can ask the question backwards if Paul and Arrow and David have been obsessing with this equation for the last 35 years, Stefan asks, can I push the equation backwards and ask what input distribution is it for which that particular function is information maximizing in the posterior? Oh, it's such a good idea. He's so smart. <laughs> and so here's, um, we, we, so we start with the idea that the output distribution, this is, um, this is just from my paper with, um, Kai Stevers and Adam Brandenburger, we start with this idea that the output distribution has to be information maximizing. I mean, Arrow really wrote about this, Fisher information maximizing, whatever, 10 years before I like, even understood what he was talking about. We have a transform function. That's the device of normalization equation. And then we simply ask, what's the input distribution? Everybody get this idea? It's so simple. And the answer is the device of normalization equation is the optimal function for encoding a Pareto type three distribution. I'm sure you're relieved and delighted to learn this fact. Now, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about Pareto type three distributions. Pareto type three distributions, well obviously you get the idea that they can have a middle that can move back and forth, captured by this parameter. And this is kind of cool, they have a steepness coefficient, obviously captured by this parameter. Okay, so now we suddenly understand what these two parameters do. These two parameters, with the constraint that we're going to live in a Pareto type 3 world for a moment, these two parameters allow the function to tune for the steepness of the distribution and its left-right position. That's, why the, that, that, that's the whole idea. Now, it turns out that um, a Pareto type 3 distribution is just a log logic to a first approximation. So this is good news for Yuri. I started with this appalling representational story, but I've managed to get to log uh, normal distributions <laughs> finally by the end of the talk. But they have one other interesting feature, which is you notice this thing is supposed to be pitched out a little bit. It's a little hard to tell. Um, these two dimensions are correlated. That is to say that the degree to which one offer tells us about the other offer is another variable that can be adjusted in this function. And it actually uses this parameter right here. I'm saying this for Su Yang, who probably thinking that already. Okay? So that's pretty cool. Are these distributions that anyone's interested in? Well, it turns out that these are power law distributions, really. These are the PDFs of a family of these guys. These are their CDFs. And what I want you to notice is that this is kind of the 1 over f distribution to a very close first approximation. So if you study, so Arrow, good news. Um, as long as it's a log logit distribution, you know, like a one over f distribution, we have actually been studying the right function. <laughs> it is the optimal encoding scheme. Now, okay, so now, now I've got to this really interesting kind of turning point in the talk. So the story I've been telling you up till now is, geez, behavioral econ economics, 
That story was that we're tragically busted because we don't follow neoclassical law in economics because our choices are weird. And what I'm telling you is, oh, you know what my hero John von Neumann got wrong? My hero John von Neumann assumed that we were costless, that we faced no costs when it came to representational precision. And if he had understood that, that representation in the brain is noisy and that there are thermodynamic costs imposed, he would have figured all of this out in like an afternoon on a napkin and left it for some a poor economist to just publish for the next 10 years. OK, so it's all about the cost. So that's cool. But I've gone a step further, and I've kind of hinted that um, this divisive normalization equation um, is the right equation for the world we live in. And now I've kind of revealed to you that that's not exactly right. The divisive normalization equation is right only for this world. And so this raises a really interesting possibility. There are two possibilities. One is we are actually perfectly efficient encoders. And because Arrow and David and I have been so dumb as to always study these kinds of worlds, we look like divisive normalization choosers. Everybody got this idea? This is a really subtle point. Divisive normalization is optimal for a Pareto type 3 world. If humans were perfect encoders of whatever distributions they found, they'd look like divisive normalizations and Pareto type normalizers in Pareto type three worlds, but they wouldn't look like that in some other worlds. They'd look like other things. This is a really cool idea. So I'm going to ask the question in this last bit, and I'm going to tell you, show you an experiment that's not really done, but that is like the most exciting experiment in my career. Um, is divisive normalization a feature of the nervous system, or is it an artifact of the fact that we've been studying choice distributions that look like this? It's a really easy hypothesis to test now that I kind of get it. And so what we're going to do is we're going to create um, four worlds for a bunch of human choosers. We're going to create a Pareto world where they're going to be choosing over Pareto distributed choice sets. Um, Michael, what I really mean is a, a Pareto distributed prize space from which I'm going to draw a choice set of either two items or six items, or a uniform world where there's no correlational structure. These are uh, like arrows clouds from the, a long time ago. OK, everybody got it? So I'm going to have uh, Pareto, uniform, two item, and six item. I have very clear predictions about what a Pareto person's going to do. And it's going to work. The Pareto person's going to do fine. The question's going to be, what happens when I ask these people to look at uniform distributions? Are they still going to normalize? Everybody got that idea? Because they shouldn't. In a uniform distribution, they should just be linear encoders. That's like the trick. If you're really following all of this, I'm, I'm sure Woodford's thinking this, so I've got to say it so he doesn't think I didn't notice it. Um, in the two item and the six item case, of course, it's not linear. It's a rising function. And um, the 6-1 rises pretty fast, which was the whole point. So the, if you think about it, Michael, the 6-1 should induce risk-seeking in a perfect encoder. OK, so it's simple, blah, blah, blah. Um, what we're going to do is um, we're going to uh, either draw from a uniform distribution two lotteries. And you're going to tell me which one you want. And they're always going to be drawn two from a uniform distribution. And they're going to do 400 trials of this. And um, then we're going to use a Pareto with a covariance term. And we're, it's so hard to do this in real time. The sampling is like nightmarish. Um, and then they're going to tell us which of these they like. And we're going to do it either with two options or with six options. Here's what the six option one looks like. It's really hard, by the way. Um, Oh, and I got the wrong one here. This was supposed to be the Pareto one. This is the work of uh, my two postdocs, uh, Verid Kurtz and uh, Vinny Alati. Vinny is an economist, and Verid is a, an economist neuroscientist. She's kind of really both. OK, so I'm going to show you one last thing. And it's a so, this is really preliminary, so don't believe anything I tell you. Um, what, this is a sort of econometric way to do it. What we basically do is we fit all the data with the divisive normalization equation, but we put this little multiplier out here, omega, and we just ask, is omega bigger than 1? 
bigger than zero. No, yeah, bigger than zero. If omega is bigger than zero, see, I have a little constant here. This is my noise term. If omega is bigger than zero, this is telling me that their choices are sigmoidal. It's a little obscure. But does everybody kind of get this idea? If this lower term is significant, they're doing divisive optimization. And if this lower term isn't significant, they're not. And so I'm going to look at that um, in the Pareto 2, in the Uniform 2, in the Pareto 5, and in the Uniform 5. And here's the test. This little guy and this little guy are super de duper de significant. OK, so let me say that another way. At least in this preliminary data set, what I'm telling you is people are obligate divisive normalizers, even when it's inefficient. Okay, that is a super deep fact, because I have now come full circle. I started with kahneman Tversky telling us that we were really inefficient. And then I told you this whole great efficiency story, which turns out to only be true in a Pareto type 3 world. And it turns out it looks like we evolved for something like a Pareto type 3 world, or something close to it. And when we get moved out of that world, we still use a Pareto type 3 model. So it turns out that in a way, everybody was right. Von Neumann was kind of right that we're sharp, efficient choosers. Carmen Tversky were right that we face biological constraints, but it's not the constraint that they expected. We're constrained in the models we can use to build our representations. It looks like we're constrained to these thermodynamically efficient divisive models, which fail actually only in uh, IIA worlds which are pretty probably rare in the real world. So that's kind of cool. OK, so I'm bringing the train into the station. I just want to say this one more way, which is really kind of puzzling and weird. And I'm, I'm prompted to say this because Woodford is here. Um, why are people risk averse? Why are people risk averse? The standard story from the 1700s is people are risk averse because it makes sense. People don't try and maximize their average long run value. They try and maximize some transform of average long run value called utility. And that's why people are risk averse. That's the story. And I'm telling you that the curvature of the utility function, which induces risk aversion, is actually an optimal solution adopted by a noisy machine to maximize long run value. OK, so what I'm really saying is Pascal was right to a first approximation or I'm hinting that Pascal may have been right. Pascal, when he was the first choice theorist in the West, he said people just maximize average long run value. People don't do that. Even Bernoulli saw that. And by 1750, it was clear that they don't. And so they invented risk aversion. And by 1965, it was clear that they screwed up probabilities. And by 1980, it was clear that they were hyperbolic discounters. And, by, and all these things accumulate. The first of them is Bernoulli's. And the answer is we were going down a blind alley the whole time. We were being efficient. And we were maximizing expected value. And all this stuff just comes out of thermodynamics. OK, thank you. That's my story. <laughs>